Welcome! Welcome, everyone, to Pen World Voices. We'd like to thank our co-sponsor, Legal Mescal, which, little known fact, is one of, Mescal is one of the oldest spirits in the Americas. Um, it's smoky and smooth, and you can taste it over there at no charge. Born and raised on the mean streets of New York City's Upper West Side, Katie Halper is a comic, writer, filmmaker, and satirist based in New York. A director of Living Liberally, Katie has performed at Town Hall, Symphony Space, The Culture Project, and The Nation Magazine Cruise, where she once made Howard Dean laugh. Her writing and videos have appeared in The New York Times, Comedy Central, and others. Her latest documentary, Kinderland, about the progressive summer camp which she attended and her mother attended and her grandmother attended will premiere at the Jewish San Francisco Film Festival this summer. Welcome, Katie. raises awareness of the pervasive inequities that exist in society and politics. Wolf Slam, Mark International Bestseller, The Beauty Myth, challenged the cosmetics industry and the marketing of unrealistic standards of beauty, launching a new wave of feminism in the early 1990s. Wolf's New York Times Bestseller, The End of America, a letter of warning to a, fam to a young patriot is an impassioned call to return to the aspirations and beliefs of the founder's ideals of liberty. Her international journalism includes the investigative report Guantanamo Bay, the inside story for the Lon Times of London. And as a columnist for Project Syndicate, her articles have been published in India, Philippines, Egypt, and Lebanon. Ben Trank is the author of the novels Miracle Man, Consent, and the recent Love is a Canoe. He has written for many pub publications, including the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, and is president and publisher of Razorbill, an imprint of Penguin. So welcome, Naomi and Ben. Um, thank you all. Thank you, Penn. This is by far the coolest place I've ever spoken. I've never had um, a, you know, I've never had a Mickey Mouse with a giant erection in a <laughs> venue that uh, that I had the, the pleasure of speaking in, and it's it's a wonderful first. As is the, you know, cool people area that we were allowed to sit in. That's never happened either. So because of Penn, I feel very cool, and um, I'm delighted to be here. And thank you for um, for the honor of including me. Um, but I'm also going to be talking about uh, something very, very serious. Um, I should explain how it came to be that uh, this obsession discussion with me in it is called truth. Um, Jakob called me and said, we want you to do, to appear in this slot called obsession, where you talk about your obsession. And of course, my, my latest book is called Vagina and is about the vagina. And uh, I sort of hesitated, and I said, well, I'm not so comfortable with the transition, you know, from this subject matter to that being my obsession. Um, I'm delighted to talk about the book, I'm delighted to talk about what's in it, uh, but can we have another pivot? And he said, okay, let's call it truth. You're obsessed with truth. I'm like, that's fine, that's fine, we'll talk about truth. Um, but we can also talk about the vagina in the context of talking about truth. Um, I'm gonna speak for uh, about 10 or, 12 minutes, and then we're going to have a group conversation, and then we'll have a collective conversation. And just a housekeeping thing, uh, please bear with me. I had a fall recently, so I'm wearing a brace, and it means that sometimes at odd moments I'll need to stand up. So 
so don't overread that. It just makes me more comfortable. Um, so when I was thinking about truth, uh, some, some stories came into my mind. Can we have the house lights up a little bit so I can see people's faces, if that's possible? And the first story, um, it's really apropos because my wonderful niece, Yardena, is visiting us um, from, from far away. And the last time she visited us, she's a freshman in college, she's very tormented. Um, and she's tormented because in her sorority, which is a very uh, sort of well-established southern sorority in a very famous campus, um, famous for all kinds of things that are very, very traditional, positive and negative, she was seeing that there was institutionalized racism and specifically some very ugly racial segregation going on in the Greek system. And um, someone had tweeted or said online to the other sorority sisters, oh, we can't have that woman as a pledge uh, for our freshman class because she, she, she date, she's dated a black guy. She's a white woman who dated a black man. And Yardena's immediate response, I think, online was something like, what the fuck are you talking about? You know, it was completely outraged and used an obscenity, which I'm very proud of her for. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it was like, this was insane, of course, to her. How can you even think that? But then she discovered that, in fact, this was a, thank you so much, this was a very common attitude among a lot of her sorority sisters, that they couldn't, they wouldn't, not only were they not taking African-American you know, young women, they weren't taking Caucasian young women who consorted across the color line at this particular school. Um, so this is, of course, you know, very, very shocking to her, and she started speaking out about it, um, and she started getting ostracized by her sorority sisters. And she was a freshman. Like, this was her first semester of college, and her family was far away. Um, and, and she was being ostracized in very vicious ways and facing that aloneness that happens when you stand up and speak out and all the people around you turn against you. Um, and so she really wrestled with this. And we all knew, and didn't have to tell her because she's smart enough <clears throat> to know herself, that of the many options she looked at for what can I do, there wasn't an option of nothing. And there wasn't an option of go along with it. So all the other categories, you know, were what she was wrestling with. You know, how do I address this? How do I work around this? How do I change it? Um, not work around it like ignore it, but like transform it. Um, and she's, you know, 18, and it was a big thing to take on. So I'm just so proud of her for the misery and unhappiness and shittiness she went through because of her knowing that she had to live her truth about this and not um, make nice with her sorority sisters and pretend that this was okay with her. And I'm really, really proud of her because uh, just a few months later, she actually um, got elected to student government and is now in charge of sorority policy <laughs> and what she's taking on. Um, and she also got uh, elected to this organization started by the guy who integrated her university 30 years ago, and its mission is racial integration. So she's in a position now to transform policies around this and to create really constructive um, situations on campus where people can, you know, face this very ugly thing. It's funny, I had a dream last night, or the night before, about, um, and it was kind of a nightmare, about being in a place where bodies had been buried and they were coming up. You know, and in a way, when something really ugly gets surfaced, I, it, it was a, it's not a difficult dream to deconstruct the phrase where the bodies are buried. And what was so amazing about Yardena's uh, finding her truth or living her truth in this is that she was looking at something so ugly and she knew it was ugly and she felt it as ugly. It's where the bodies were buried in her community and she was not going to pretend that there wasn't a stinking corpse in the room. Um, so... I want to tell you about the lunch I had today with, El uh, yesterday with, is it today? Today, with El Painkillers. It makes me a little stupid. Um, with another truth teller, Alberto Mora. Um, he's the guy who, very early on, before we knew in America that people were being tortured in Guantanamo and in Abu Ghraib, he was a member of the Bush administration um, and a lawyer, and 
he was the person who wrote the memo saying these 19 things that Rumsfeld has said are okay to do are illegal. And, you know, they certainly constitute torture, but he made the case in his talk earlier today that international law and U.S. treaties um, that the United States has signed don't even go start at the torture level, they start at the cruelty level. That, you know, you don't have to be torturing someone to break the law. You have to be treating them cruelly. And, of course, the Constitution forbids cruel and inhuman treatment. Um, and so he, he said when the collective yes-men who wanted to, you know, do what Rumsfeld wanted them to do because they were willing to not notice where the bodies were buried, right, notice the stinking corpse in the room, he put his career on the line eventually by saying, okay, if you go ahead with this, I'm going to release this memo to, to everyone in, uh, in this whole community internally, and then someone else leaked the memo. And so he was on the record in public, um, and he didn't back away from it, uh, saying this is wrong, and he, he put his career on the line, and many, many other people didn't. And what he said to the people around him was, you know, you're going to be on the wrong side of history with this. And he said at a time when, you remember that bloodlust the country was engaged in 2003, 2004, you know, put them in a place beyond the rule of law. It doesn't matter what you do to them, it's all about saving American lives. <clears throat> and I was very moved uh, during lunch to learn that he was a descendant of people who fled Nazi Germany, people who fled Cuba um, before, uh, you know, what, you know, before that became a place you couldn't flee. Um, three lines of refugees in his family and in his wife's family uh, had known, and he said, you know, I know from history that that never goes anywhere good, you know, and that it's not, and that it's not ambiguous, and that we both sort of said at the same time, it's black and white. And the amazing thing about someone like Alberta Warren, I'm getting chills just thinking about it, is that he, he's surrounded by people who are willing to be gray about this black and white issue, do we torture, right? And equivocate, and that's what fascinates me about truth and lies. I'm absolutely fascinated with how a society, people in a society can join together to tell a lie together when everybody knows that it's a lie, right? And then when someone walks into the room and says, wait, you're, this is a total lie, this is a completely false, they, they often kill that messenger. That really, again and again, draws me as a dynamic. Um, how people lie to themselves. And the thing I noticed about Alberto Mora and other men like him who have said no to torture and to Guantanamo and to Abu Ghraib and to the many, many violations, drone strikes, assassinations, all the things that Penn is, is a warrior against, um, is that men like that, I mean, they, the ones I've met who've said no all happen to be men. It's not that that's all there is. Um, but they, how can I put it? It's, they don't, it's not like they don't think of themselves as heroes. I think they know that they're heroes because they're heroes. But they don't, there was no other way they could act. They're, they're, they know that there was no alternative. Like with Yardena, people who are living in a state of truth know that there is no alternative to taking that action they know is predicated upon what they know to be true. It's a kind of matter of factness about what the next step is, even if they know it means no more friends, no more job, no more status, no more money, no more recognition. You know, it all goes up in flames. They have no choice. It's black and white. Um, the last person I want to tell you about is an amazing quite obscure character that I'm writing about for my next book named John Addington Simmons. This was a, a, a gay writer in the middle of the 19th century in Britain at a time when it was um, becoming more and more heavily criminalized to be a male homosexual. In other words, at the beginning of the 19th century, sodomy was a crime, but as the 19th century progressed, and this is the thing about laws like this, laws like like that criminalize speech or criminalize dissent or criminalize love, right? They metastasize, they proliferate. That's the nature of evil. Alberto Mora called it force creep. When you give people permission to torture a little bit, then inevitably 
you get it across a whole community. And the same thing is true with, um, with tyranny, basically. And so at the beginning of the 19th century, uh, sodomy was a crime, but it was very hard to prove, and very few people were convicted for it. But as the century wore on, um, you, you know, it was a crime if you didn't ejaculate inside the other person's body, right? And then believe it or not, the, the microscope was developed, and so a whole subgenre of testimony uh, was introduced into court about whether or not there had been ejaculation in this relationship, and if there had been people faced like 10 years in jail or lifetime in jail. Whipping came back, right? People were whipped for being homosexual. Um, and then by 1885, with uh, another law, um, which is better known, male homosexual friendship and relationships became criminalized. So that by the reading of that law, if a man introduced another man to a third man and those two men got together, the first man could be convicted, right? Um, so you see this metastasization. And John Eddington Simmons moves me because he knew he was gay all his life. He married, he had a child, uh, he lived a completely closeted life, but his whole life he tried to tell the truth under a context in which that would damn him to prison or ruin his life. And then as obscenity law developed, and I won't even get into that, it, it also became a crime to tell the truth about that love or, any, or many, many forms of sexuality. And so what he did was that he found genre after genre after genre to try to tell the truth about the love he had for other men. He tried biographies of great homosexuals in the past. He tried privately printed pamphlets um, with these erotic poems that he would pass out to certain friends but then destroy. You know, at one point, he put all of his erotic writings into a box and stood on the River Avon and threw the key to the box into the river because the writings themselves were a crime, right? He was incriminating his friends by them reading about male homosexual love. Um, it was a criminalized act of reading and writing. And yet, his whole life, he believed in literature and in the power of truth in words. And again, this gives me chills just to think about it. Finally, the last thing he did in his whole career was to write a book that changed our world, and it's called Sexual Inversion. He wrote it with Havelock Ellis. And what that did was it introduced an idea of homosexuality and other sexual ways of being in what's called sexology, as like clinical categories, right, across a neutral medicalized spectrum, right, almost like zoology. It's just a variation. And by putting it in that framework, that became acceptable. Society was ready for that. This was embraced. It was very influential. And to this day, the way we think about sexual variation is in this sexological framework. You know, for better and worse, I, it's got its weaknesses. But the point is, the last thing he published which came out after he died, transformed the you know, West, transformed the West and opened the door to the relative equality that many homosexual people have compared to the 19th century in the West. But what's most heartbreaking about John Eddington Simmons is that he never lived to see that, but also 50 years after his death, people were allowed to open a manuscript that he had written, which was a very graphic, explicit, honest autobiography, including a lot of sexual experiences that he, he wrote and knew he would never be alive for anyone to read it, ever. And he said, you've got to wait 50 years to open this. Everyone he knew would be dead. But he, he knew or he believed that there would be a day in which there was a reading public that would welcome and receive that life and those truths. He believed that. He believed in words having the power to bring about that world, and he believed enough in words, and kind of believed enough in the future, that he was willing to write a big manuscript that no one in his lifetime would ever, 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 ever lay eyes on. So those are um, four stories of people who are living their truths, and the relationship of telling the truth to language, which is what we're doing here, what Penn is doing. Why? Do people around the world try to silence the truth tellers? Why do governments hate truth tellers? Why does Penn around the world 
uh, champion writers, activists, people like Ai Weiwei, who tell the truth and then are arrested, imprisoned, tortured, um, ostracized, uh, silenced. Why is that? Um, because and it's so interesting. Penn was, am I allowed to say Penn was attacked today, like had a cyber attack? You may not know that. We can talk about that in the Q&A if I'm allowed to. But, you know, what we're doing here is dangerous. What Penn does is dangerous. Telling the truth is dangerous. It's dangerous because it changes things. And why does it change things? Um, I, think that tr I think the truth or words spoken in truth, and now I'm kind of getting into the metaphysical, I think that they're not just words. I think that they create an alternative dimension of reality and that they carry an energy with them. I mean, all words carry an energy with them, for better and worse. But that the energy that words of truth carry creates possibilities that don't exist, creates um, power, unleashes power that didn't exist before, and particularly unleashes power in the hearts of individual men and women all over the world to, to challenge things they weren't willing to challenge before, to change themselves and change those around them, to not be sedated, to wake up, to bring um, the future into the present. And it's for that reason, I think, that people try to silence the truth tellers all over the world. And um, it's for that reason I'm so honored to be here. Thank you very much. said about um, the concept of living your truth um, and I certainly thought for, for the audience I, I wondered I was, I, in, in the framework of a, of a Mad Libs uh, uh, this is vital for a blank life according to you <laughs> wait truth telling is vital for a what life? no uh, uh, this idea of living your truth conceptually is uh, vital for a blank life. I mean, on a live life? I mean, I guess to, to respond to that, there is something I, I was going to say, but I ran out of time, so I'll say it now, which is that I have noticed that people who are in that place of having to tell and live their truth, they are different from everyone else, and the difference is that the kind of like, the air around them kind of crackles. Like, they, you can see them more clearly. It's really extraordinary. They are they're often more playful, like Ai Weiwei, you know, I keep thinking about him because he's just such a dramatic example of this. But they often have this like childlike spontaneity and joy, even though they often suffer, you know, are made to suffer more than people who go along with things. Um, I don't really understand that, except that I think that lies have a deadening quality. I mean, we talk about words having energy and lies have their own energy, which is muffling, deadening, heavy, um, burdensome, and so people who are in that state, you know, god-awful things happen to them, but they're, they're generally very happy, vivid people. I mean, happy, um, alert, alive, compelling, vivid people. It, am I speaking to what you're asking? Sure. Yeah. Um, it, w when you were talking, I was reminded of the a Paul Robeson quote, which of course I can't recall now verbatim, but he talks about the artists having two choices or having a choice whether to be a force, I'm paraphrasing, but force for good or force for bad, and he said, I never had a choice. Like, it was always that way for him. Um, do you think that that's true, that, that for some people it's not, I mean, you alluded to this, but the idea that it's not even, they don't even see themselves as brave, you, kind, you started to say, because they don't see it as a choice. Like, it's so obvious that they have to do that. Yeah. Um, so your question, My question is, is... I guess to elaborate on, on that, if you've observed that and, and how, how people see it, whether they see it as a choice or they just see it as a kind of a no-brainer that obviously right. they had to do that. Yeah, I mean, I can, I can speculate about the people that I've witnessed, um, but I can also speak from my own experience about moments when I knew I had to tell the truth, not that I'm putting myself in their category, but aspiring to you know, emulate them. Um, I'm often asked in interviews, 
why, what does it feel like to be criticized so much? And I mean, that's a very standard question that Naomi, Google Naomi Wolf, oh, I can ask why, you know, what's it like to be you know, criticized all the time? And, um, and uh, I, you know, I have had my share of criticism and it's lasted my whole career as well as, you know, more than my share of support and warmth and, and affection, which I'm very grateful for as well. But, um, like most recently, I wrote this book about female sexuality and about the vagina, and I included six pages of an experience that I had, um, which I really struggled about, and I wrote a whole draft of the book with two drafts, without any personal experience in it. Um, because I knew that women who put their personal experience of sexuality into any text or any uh, public record uh, are destroyed. I mean, I knew that from studying this theme, and I knew it from, you know, you have to be an idiot in this culture not to know that. Um, and so I knew that that would happen. But when people, and it got very, very, very uh, soundly criticized, those six pages, interestingly enough. Um, but when people said, uh, did you struggle over this? I my thought process after I'd, I'd written a false version of the book twice, right, without my personal experience in it, I knew that if I didn't put what led me to the journey of researching the neuroscience of the brain-vagina connection, which was a personal experience, if I didn't put that in, um, I would publish the book, the book would be received, it would be reviewed, and then I'd be in a forum like this, and the first question I knew I would get is, what led you to write this book? And at that point, I would have to either lie or tell the truth. And I never lie to my readers. I think that's one reason I have a, a, the kind of relationship with my readers that I do, which is very um, you know, personal and very um, emotional. Like, I'm not saying it's better or worse than any other writer, but people, when, they, when, they, when I meet my readers, they often tell me that I've kind of accompanied them, uh, like a friend or a colleague or whatever, through a journey or a difficult time, whatever, and I'm honored by that. But um, so I knew that at that moment I wouldn't be able to lie because I don't lie to my readers. And so I thought I might as well just bite the bullet and put this in because I'll have to address it one way or another. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but it's, it's, there wasn't an alternative of lying to my readers. I don't have that option, and I think I don't have that option because I know that if I lied to my readers, my prose would suffer. I mean, I, I've read prose in which writers are lying. You can tell a mile off when someone's lying to their readers. It's, it stinks, you know, it makes the work so bad. And it makes it dumb and dull, I, I mean like blunt, it blunts the edge of it. Yeah. So, because <clears throat> it's interesting to talk about the audience because you would ask to have the lights go up on the audience and, and that had changed the dynamic in some ways quite a bit. So I was wondering, and you spoke to some of this, but what, uh, what do you think they want or expect from you as 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 much as a speaker tonight, when everybody's sort of listening, astonishing. We go to a lot of readings. People don't look at the the speaker the way they're looking at you tonight. So, what is that dynamic? What do you think everybody here wants? Or I mean, I I wouldn't presume to know. I'm sure we'll hear in the you know in the conversational period. I I don't know. Everyone's here for their own reason. I wouldn't want to generalize. What do you what do you hope that they take away from you? I mean, in a way, that's not my business to impose on them. I, I was very lucky, because my dad's a writer, and he, he, he had kind of apprenticed me very early to what he made a clear distinction of, which is the difference between the career of the writer and the life of the writer. And he basically had no patience or respect for the career of the writer, and he's a very obscure writer. He, he wrote his whole life, and almost no one knows his name, um, but he was a very admirable, it was a very admirable life because he was living a life of, of, of the writer and um, it made him a very good teacher of, of, of writing as well. Um, but he basically always instilled in me this certainty that it's my job to write the truest and best book I can and that after that it's none of my business what like, it, it, I'm not allowed to impose on my readers an assumption, an expectation. It's theirs. You know, he said, after you write it, you let it go. It doesn't belong to you anymore. It's, it's theirs. And they bring what they should or need to to that radical act of reading. But it's not a hierarchical relationship. It's a dynamic. It's a form of love. It's a dynamic, equal relationship. 
You talk about um, your niece, and you just mentioned your father, and I was wondering if you had a kind of, not genetic predisposition, but if you felt like you were raised by, in an environment that fostered this kind of truth telling. And what, I have two questions. One is, the first time you remember be, um, being a truth teller yourself, and the first time you remember observing it in someone else. Um, sure, and forgive me, I'm standing up. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so I definitely was raised in a house that fostered uh, creativity um, because, uh, well, I wrote about this in my book, The Tree House, which was about my growing up. It was a house of yes. Like, whatever you wanted to do, if, there, if it involved creativity, it was a yes. Can I paint things all over the walls? Yes. You know, can I make a medieval meal that you all have to eat, and it's completely disgusting. Yes, you know, yes, 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 yes. In San yes, Francisco, yes. right? In San Francisco. Yeah, you, you, you're smiling because you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, there's Yardena, who knows what I'm talking about. Her, her dad was raised the same way. Um, and it, it does create, I think her dad and I, my brother and I, both raised in this house, we don't have any respect for categories. Um, and so he's a very interdisciplinary guy, and, and I feel like I am not intimidated by genres. You know, I don't care. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say, though, that it was a house that trained us to be truth tellers. In some ways, it trained us to be fabulous. Because um, we were just joking before we came here. My, my mother, your dentist grandmother, joined us. And we had a discussion about where did the phrase druid oak come from, right? There in the south, in Alabama, there are druid oaks and a part of Tuscaloosa is named Druid Hill. And of course, my mom had what we called when, it, when, it, when we were growing up, if one of us would say, why is the sky blue? You know, my mother, rather than not answering, would make something up. You know, some fantastic imaginary thing and tell it to us. And we got to call it Wolf's Biological Firsts because it was invented. Um, and so she, of course, said about this, well, I'm sure that immigrants from Ireland who were secretly pagans named these oaks Druid Oaks. And of course, Yardena googled the real answer. Um, we can do that now, we can google the real answer. But, uh, so that's not a truth, it's actually an invention, but it, it definitely um, made us aware of the beauty and charm of creating uh, imaginary things. Uh, I wouldn't say she's trying to deceive us, but um, there was a lot of room for storytelling in our house. Yeah. But did I answer your question? Yeah, and then just the, if you have a memory of the first time you felt the obligation to be a truth teller. Um, I should, I actually, sh I'm, I'm being kind of unfair though about the imperative to tell the truth in our, our lineage because more formidable than my mother or my father or anyone was our grandmother, your dentist's great grandmother, Faye Goldman who died recently, and she was a dramatic and radical truth teller, and she did not have any time or patience for anything short of that, and it was a matter of character for her. And I actually, as some of you know that um, my partner and I were arrested, uh, I think the year before last, uh, for telling a group of Occupy protesters what their rights were to stay on the sidewalk, and, um, and it was a very scary experience. And when I was about to be arrested, a very scary police officer came bearing down on me in a physically intimidating way, this is on video, and uh, said something like, um, you have to get off the sidewalk, and I stood still and very calmly because I think I remembered Faye Goldman's instructions you know, to be very respectful in a situation like that. I very calmly told him that the law said that they had a right to be there, and then he yelled again, will you get out of my way? Will you back down? And I swear to God, I could hear Grandma Faye saying, he's just a bully, don't you move. You know, don't you move. And that was the kind of person she was. She, but it was that, it was that being a person of character, and truth telling was part of that. Um, I mean, other things were part of that, you know, showing up, writing thank you notes, you know, it wasn't just truth telling. So I guess the first time I guess, when, I can't remember the first time I felt obliged to not fib, but um, I certainly, when I came east, and I, I was aware that there were things like racism and sexism, which I had, had kind of been sheltered from, 
growing up in San Francisco at the middle of this, all this revolutionary uh, ferment, I noticed that when I would say this is not okay, I was not always aligned with the dominant moment. I still remember the first time I was silenced, that I didn't tell the truth. It's a more in, a stronger uh, memory. Um, I was sexually harassed by a very famous professor at Yale when I was 19, and I didn't tell the truth. And I chose, I felt like I had no choice because uh, I, I felt for good reasons that I wouldn't have a career ever again if I went up against this very powerful person in the university that was protecting him. Um, and I, I felt for the next 20 years how that betrayal of my own experience and that um, abandonment of all the young women who came after me who might be jeopardized by my not having told the truth uh, was like a, a weakness or festering part of my character. It was a, a, something I was not in harmony with. I mean, I, I, had, a, I had a question about certain, that I'm thinking now you're sort of asking me to address in a, what you've been talking about in a different way, which is um, for very young people today and what I would suspect with some of them is a relatively hazy relationship to the truth uh, when it, you know, recorded stuff that young people do and how they interpret and stuff like that. I w I w you did, you recorded No, 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 I'm, I'm just, <laughs> I'm, I'm suggesting that for very young people like when you were 19 and even younger, uh, who may have grown up without your sort of strong relationship to the truth, is there a particular story that you would tell them that would give them a hardline clarification of, of what is true and what is not true. I, see, that's so interesting that you asked that question because I really do think that everyone knows inside and that mm -hmm. telling people doesn't do any good. I mean... At, at what, if I can... Because yeah. I was thinking about this too in terms of the, the playground. And at, at what age do you think people intrinsically know? I think people come into the planet knowing. I mean, I, I, I think you know from the minute you're conscious you know, what, what's, what truth, what it means to be aligned with your own experience or dissembling about your own experience. Um, I don't think that there's a place or consciousness before a knowledge of that, because by the time you're self-conscious, you're conscious of either your words representing who you are and what you believe, or your words not representing who you are and what you believe. I mean, it's true that there's a developmental stage where kids think if they've got, you know, chocolate crumbs all over their faces and they say, I didn't take a cookie, that they can, you know, that'll be okay or that, that works. Um, but, you know, consciousness comes by the time you're six or seven or eight, I think you're thinking very, I think children are much more sophisticated than we give them credit for in terms of their consciousness. I think the, we get dumber as we get older, usually. And that, uh, that's why I love being around young people and people in their teens and early 20s because they haven't become used to lying. Um, and I think that you know teenagers have a very vivid sense of the truth and that's why the hypocrisy of the adult world looks so disgusting to them. Um, so I, I guess I just think that everybody knows. Like I, I think we have, we have this internal compass that if you're lucky, you're raised to respect it and to recognize it and to consult it. And if you're unlucky, especially if you're sexually abused or abused in some way, it, it fucks up your relationship to that compass because you're not allowed to know what you know. Um, and it takes a lifetime sometimes to recover that relationship to that compass, but I do think it's there. I think it's part of the human so, mechanism. So if I could extend from that, because we, we, when you open, you talked about cruelty and the legal definition of cruelty. Um, would the same be true for uh, criteria for for the definition of emotional cruelty in relation to young people and, and truth? Do you mean, do, are you asking, do young people know when someone's being emotionally cruel to them? Or vice, or when they are being emotionally cruel. Or would they be emotionally cruel? Is, is it the same truth and emotional cruelty? That they, or is it intrinsic to their character that they would know? That they would know, that's a good question. I mean, I was very blessed because I was not raised in a context of emotional cruelty, so I don't know what it's like to be dependent for love on someone who is also cruel to you. Um, and I know from working with survivors of sexual abuse that 
there are very complicated survival strategies kids in that situation have to do in order to suppress their knowledge of the cruelty so that they can keep loving the person they need to keep loving. Um, but I, I do believe, because of the way those memories unpack in later life for people who survive that, that there's always a place where there's a consciousness that this is not love the way it should be, and that it may not be till adulthood that they can be, feel safe enough to uh, be in that part of their own awareness. Does that make sense to you all what I just said? Should we open it up to the audience? I'm sure everyone has questions, or lots of people have questions. Um, I'm gonna just flip my mic over and you can come up to this microphone. Maybe people would be more comfortable if you passed a mic around. They look so cozy. Is it okay? Is it all right if I just bring people the mic? I'd love you to just define what truth is to you and what makes one a truth teller. Um, Glenn Beck is a truth teller to some people, as despicable as he is, but he is a truth teller. So what is truth to you and what makes one a truth teller? Oh, man. Can I ask what truth is to you? That's why I'm here. <laughs> wow. I, I would love to know what you mean by that. I think most of us struggle with truth and search for it. This is so beautiful. I'm going to try. Um, that's really beautiful. Thank you for, I think that was very brave of you. I mean, I think what you just did is an example of truth telling. Um, this woman, you know, in front of a room full of strangers who she couldn't be sure would be supportive of what she just shared, said something true about herself and her journey that was um, honest and not uh, self-regarding, right? She wasn't, co she wasn't covering a vulnerability. Um, so that's truth telling, that's very brave. So I guess I, I'm answering your question by saying, I think you just did it, huh? <laughs> um, I mean, I'm, I'm reluctant to kind of, um, God, I, I don't think I know what truth is because I'm on the same journey that you're on, but I do know it when I see it when someone else is telling the truth. Like, you recognize right away. Uh, let, me, let me give you an example of something that, that I know is wrong, okay? And I'm going to name names. Charlie Savage, who writes for the New York Times, covers the torture beat. Um, regularly, he will use the phrase, uh, well, he, this used to drive me so crazy, they used to use the phrase, harsh interrogation. And then they were slapped around enough by whoever slaps people like this around so that he started using the phrase, brutal inter interrogation. Well, now we know that those words were Orwellian euphemisms for torture and crimes. Um, but they still often don't use that word because it's, uh, it would alienate a lot of powerful people who don't want that word used because it would mean that a lot of them would go to jail. And so... Uh, a phrase that he uses a lot these days is, talking about Guantanamo, is the category of prisoners who are too dangerous to release. Okay? Now, in American law, where you're innocent until proven guilty and you're guaranteed due process and a right to a fair and speedy trial, there is no such category. That was invented by the evil shits who are going to go to hell in the Bush administration who made this shit up. Legally, people like Bybee and you. And I do, think, I do think there is a hell of some kind for those people, and I think they're going there. And this is not a theological statement. It's, 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 it's just a statement of certainty that, you know, ugh, I don't even want to think about being in that consciousness. That is a state of untruth, you know, what those people did. It's a crime worse than the actual crimes of the tortures because it's a thought crime. It's a crime of, of messing with language and concepts enough to deceive people to commit other, you know, to, to encourage other people to commit crimes, right? It's worse than the people who are actually on the ground doing the bad things. Um, but anyway, he's, he's regurgitating this category for political purposes, or God knows why, because his editor isn't smart enough to red pencil it, and by doing so, by being careless or you know, craven or God knows what, I hope he hears this and, you know, writes to me to tell me why he would use this category. I'll certainly write to him. Um, he creates a space in a very important part of our culture that validates the idea that there are people who are too dangerous to release, as if that's a thing in America, 
There is no such thing unless you live in a totalitarian state. Now, they may be too dangerous to release because they'll tell the truth about how they were tortured. Um, and then they're dangerous to the people who tortured them. That's how they're dangerous. Um, but that's an example of someone who, day after day after day, in a very privileged position, abuses, I think, his um, obligation to scrutinize his own words. I, oh, I'm sorry. example you just gave is really clear in terms of how language can be used to obfuscate the truth. Um, and I'm just curious, I think in relationship, um, sometimes truth is more about listening and reciprocity. And so something that I find really confusing and challenging, um, something I find really confusing and challenging um, is how to figure out what's true um, when I'm also working really hard to listen and kind of co-create that truth. Um, and so I'm wondering like how you kind of maintain your own commitment to truth for yourself. Um, and then also there's a question of non-harming sometimes when it comes to telling the truth if people aren't ready to face things. So I think it's really complex when it comes to relationship. You're, you're, you're completely right. And you're all raising you know the right questions because it's easy enough to stand on a stage and talk about truth, but the really hard part is to, you know, <laughs> work with it in daily life, right? Because it is in a relationship where it is on the journey that it gets tried and tested. Um, and things are not simple in relationship. And in fact, uh, my loved ones, I think, often um, reflect to me the downside of, uh, I mean, the, the position of, you know, this is my truth, can be a very arrogant one and a not listening one and... And these are things that my loved ones have shared with me about myself and what I need to do. So I need to do more of what it sounds like you're good at, which is that listening and making space for the other person's um, equally valid truth. Uh, that's hard. Um, I mean, so it sounds like you're saying that some people, uh, because of their background and temperament, are better at eliciting the other person's truth, but that sometimes that suppresses their own? Is that what you're saying? Um, or, or the other way around, too. Or, I mean, I'm sure that lots of people struggle with this. Um, when you want, um, when you really want to learn and co-create a truth, and you want it to be reciprocal, um, but then there's this, this need to kind of also maintain your sense of reality, and then also finding a balance between um, doing what's right um, and not causing harm to people that aren't there with you. Right. So, so these are two very big and I would say different things. Um, so the first one is, you know, a total journey. I have no wisdom for you because I'm not that good at it. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm very good at knowing what I think, but I'm not that good at adapting uh, in an intimate dialogue to what the people around me might need or want. Um, so that's my journey. Trying to get better at that. Um, actually, a very valuable thing that I, I should pay more attention to is something my good friend Susie once told me, which is listening doesn't mean saying yes. You know, listening doesn't mean agreeing, it just means giving space to the other person's reality. Uh, the second thing is about kindness, and I, what I think you're talking about what Buddhists call right speech or ethical speech, where you might, it might be true to say, you know, <laughs> I mean, my mother said to me this evening when I was wearing a different outfit to cover the race. What? I knew it was going to be an outfit related. Oh, yeah. Outfit. Oh, yeah. And a mom related one. She's like, you're not going to wear that. <laughs> She's like, you're going to be on stage. And, you know, and I was like really annoyed. <laughs> but um, so she was being truthful. And she's probably right. It was kind of wrinkled and messy. Um, but... I was upset at her for being that truthful at that moment. And so I guess what the Buddhists say about ethical speech is that you have to be sensitive to the moment and not necessarily bludgeon people over the head with truth. Um, and there, and there, that's where tact is lovely. Pardon me. Um, I mean, you said something, Yardena said something wonderful to me in the taxi. She said it would be really cool if you didn't da 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 da, -da um, about the story that I told. And that was a very gentle loving, respectful way to say, I'd really like you to not, whatever. So I think there are people who are tactful 
who can not lie, but not drag every awful fact out that doesn't have to be there you know, and hurt people. I don't want to miss the people in the back. I'm sorry, do you want to be the person sure, I can do doing that. the or thing? Paul, do you want to, or this this lady with the pad, yes, had a, an observation. Do you want to have this Okay. Um, first, uh, thank you, Naomi, for being uh, very truthful about some great horrors that exist in the world that you've spoken out about. And the example of your niece, I think, is very important. But one thing sort of bothered me, um, where you talked about her truth, or people uh, speaking about their truth. And the fact is that certain things are right, and certain things are wrong. And to speak the truth is to call out those things that are wrong. And that, for instance, the things that you've spoken about, and I'm sure many people here in Penn have spoken about, Guantanamo, the drones, Obama's hit list, stop and frisk, mass incarceration, preventing women having reproductive choice, preventing abortion, things like that. And so I think that it's standing up for those things. And, and there's a point at where the things that you know are grievously wrong or tremendously right come in with one's personal morality. And that's a place where epistemology and, and morality meet. And this is the point. And not everyone is born with, the, with knowing what's right and wrong. Okay. All right, so thank you for uh, that. I I'm going to respectfully really disagree with you on parts of it. Um, so something that I've noticed in studying um, societies that are, are uh, tyrannies is that people are sure that they're right and that what they're doing is morally right and, uh, that, and they see things in black and white. Um, so on the one hand, I agree with some of what you said. For instance, a good example is clitoridectomy or genital mutilation. Um, there was a nonsensical early feminist position that Western women shouldn't have anything to say about infibulation because it's not their culture. I think that's nonsense. And that's a good example of, you know, there's right, there's wrong, if someone's being injured, you speak up for them uh, to the extent that you can. Um, however, when I say Yardena's truth, or Glenn Beck's truth, which he said or someone said, um, I say it with a lot of respect because, you know, one example you gave is the abortion issue. So I'm pro-choice, for the most part, but I wrote an essay in 1995 that was very controversial at the time called Our Bodies, Our Souls, that basically said that there is a lot of moral ambiguity about this and that the pro-choice movement does itself no favors by pretending that it's a black and white issue and that, that uh, I actually was taken to a retreat um, with people on the pro-life side and people on the pro-choice side um, and facilitated by these wonderful nuns called Common Ground who live in Washington who make people who hate each other's guts like Hutu and Tutsi or Boer and ANC, you know, Palestinians and Israelis Force, you know, they force people to kind of understand each other. And it was life-changing for me, and uh, now I'm quite sure that people can arrive at policy outcomes that I hate from, a, from a motivations I respect. And it's made me not dismiss conservatives, it's made me not dismiss pro-life people, it's made me not dismiss people who believe in military solutions or people who believe in guns. Um, there are a lot of good people who have good reasons and good arguments for reaching a conclusion that I hate or that I oppose politically. Um, and that's where democracy is so beautiful and free speech is so important and, and why what Penn is doing, what we're doing here is so important because these different truths have to wrestle with each other in safe, respectful conversations um, and in a democratic context in which uh, there is a dialogue and there is a debate and the views of the majority get 
supported that the views of everyone, you know, have the right to influence the debate or to change people's views or to mobilize support. Um, and that's good, you know, and it, in, in, my, in my experience, it's very bad. It's very bad in movements. It's bad in the feminist movement. It's bad in the environmental movement. It's bad in every movement I've ever been part of when there's a group consensus or a list of things that everyone has to believe in in order to be part of the group. Um, and it, it is a form of tyranny, and it, it suppresses truth. I mean, often truth has to, people's truth or collective truth is a process of hashing it out, right? And so many things I thought I believed I don't believe anymore because I've been in a struggle, a good, honest, digni dignified struggle with someone who challenged me on, on those beliefs, and I, I rethought them. Um, and that's so precious. Uh, yes, sir. Great, you're the, the guy with the mic. Thank you, um, Deji, Work for Penn, Freedom to Write Team. This is a real honor. Um, your book, Vagina, was censored on the Apple iTunes store. Uh, they didn't want the whole word. So there's some censorship there. Uh, I wanted to know how that got resolved, first part. But then the second part is, if it was an automated decision, was this, who made that decision? If it was an automated decision, what is happening to truth now? You know, the world of big data, people are making these sorts of decisions on a, on a, a very large scale, mm -hmm. and that affects truth. So right. So that's a great question. I don't know the answer to who censored vagina on iTunes. Um, it's a great uh, headline. I hope someone writes that piece and does that investigative report. Um, but it was V and then a series of asterisks until there was an outcry from women. And this is also uh, a lot of really, really corny titles uh, were not censored. So it was definitely a double standard. Um, I, it was very satisfying when the book was at the top of the iTunes bestseller list for a long time after that uh, battle was won. Uh, and I think, and this is the power of the free press, my brilliant publicist, and I'm not going to name names because she could get in trouble, um, leaked the censoring to a reporter at The Independent and, who then called me and I said, well, this should outrage the women of da da, -da. And so then that's the beauty of um, like creating a news event or creating a counterbalance to a news event. Then that sparked other coverage and outcry. And then whoever had made the decision at Apple thought, well, I don't want to be on the receiving end of this criticism. And then they backed off and put the whole thing out there. Um, but it was my sneaky, it was my sneaky publicist who, uh, who challenged that censorship. Um, it seems like you've, you've, and this is with all due respect, but it seems like you've touched on this already a few times, but I'm, I'm going to try to reframe the question if I can. Um, I think that what you're talking about, it really resonates with me, because I do feel like I have that, I've always called it my inner gut, but, you know, it's the same thing that what you're talking about, and I had to deal with it growing up in a family that was really conservative and traditional and all sorts of things. Um, so I feel like I've been doing it since I was a teenager. However, I feel like the language around what you're talking about, I feel like some, some of the rhetoric feels a little dangerous to me. And I'll tell you why, because I feel that whenever I think about the truth or, you know, things are black and white or whatever, I, 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 I get my news from left wing, right wing, independent, all sorts of stuff. When I listen to right wing radio or I, I read right wing things, um, they're all about the truth and one truth. Mm -hmm. And yet, there's a part of me, I used to work at the UN, there's a part of me that believes in certain universal truths and certain universal Human rights, for instance, um, you know, UNHCR, whatever. But but the the thing is that how do we frame this in such a way that we can talk about universal truths, but then we can have space for openness. I mean, right. I come from San Francisco too. Without openness, we we'd be nowhere. I think you know. Well, yeah, I totally totally agree with what you're saying. So you're, I mean, you're not challenging me. You're not contradicting my perspective at all. You're, you're helping me elucidate it better. Thank you. Um, I totally agree with you. That's why you may know this tonight. I keep shying away from offering something that I believe to be a truth um, because it's very dangerous, as you say. I do believe in the search for truth. You know, I do believe in each of us as individuals honoring what we feel to be true, aiming for it as an aspiration. 
one thing I'm noticing in the room is a very interesting energy in the room as we're having this conversation. It's it, all kinds of stuff is in the air, you know. I've actually never had this talk before, and so I've never felt exactly this energy before, but there's hope, but there's also mourning and grief. I think people are maybe feeling sorrow for things that they wish they could have been honest about that they couldn't, or sorrow for the child that they used to be who knew something that they couldn't say. I don't know what. I mean, it would be great to know what this energy is made of. It's complicated. Um, but... It's more like I'm talking around the pursuit of truth because the pursuit of truth creates this energy where things get broken up so that new things can grow, right? Um, do, do you understand what I mean by that? Like constructs that are set that keep us from growing get broken up by reclaiming whatever our truth is and then new things grow for us. Um, I don't, I'm not going to dictate what those things are. You're right, it's always a mistake to dictate them. Now, I believe in the Enlightenment, and I don't believe in moral relativism. I think the whole, you know, uh, fetishizing on the left in the 80s and 90s and aughts of moral relativism, so not to offend anyone, has led us into a real black hole in many ways. Um, and the more you read Enlightenment thinkers, people like Mary Wollstonecraft or Thomas Jefferson at his best, or, you know, Thomas Paine, uh, they were the ones who came up with the things that I'm willing to put my hat on, you know, in a ring and say, yeah, this is, this is a universal truth. And they are things like the freedom of the individual, the right of individuals to freedom. There are like three of them, you know, so I'm not going to go further than that. Um, but, but those are things that I do think a consensus will arise globally that everyone in the world eventually will honor and respect those three things, the right of people to be free and maybe one or two others, freedom of religion, freedom of, th of thought, freedom of the press. Um, but I'm not, I'm not going to make a dictum out of anything else because it's such a subjective individual journey. I'm, I'm only saying that I believe that there's great value for each of us in that journey. Does that help? Yeah, that does help. Good. It's a great question. I think this is the last question we have time for. Um, so you were speaking about um, lie telling, metastasizing, and growing, have kind of a snowball effect. And I think truth telling can do the same thing. I mean, we've seen that as an easy example of the civil rights movement. Um, and you mentioned that you were involved in Occupy, and I don't feel like that movement has sort of reached its critical mass yet. And I was wondering if you could give your opinion on how you can create conditions for truth telling to have that snowball effect and to have a greater effect on society. Um, that's a, a, a wonderful question as well, thank you. So just to be clear, I wasn't involved in Occupy as a member, I was just involved as a citizen, you know, because I happened to be the only nerd probably in the world who has a whole chapter on New York permit law, so <laughs> in one of my books, and so I happened to know exactly what their rights were in relationship to the sidewalk, you know, when they were being told to get off the sidewalk. Um, uh, so I, I had, I had a, a Faye Goldman relationship to Occupy, which was a citizen who knew that they were entitled to be on the sidewalk and that it was my obligation, if I knew that, to tell them that they were, had a right to be on the sidewalk. Um, so your question is, yes, I can tell you conditions. Occupy has been crushed because of brutal, brutal uh, arrest methods. Um, that uh, led people to be incarcerated for 48 hours without being allowed to go to the bathroom in LA or having being threatened with 10-year sentences or having new laws passed in the darkness that makes it a 10-year you know, conviction to protest near a government official or um, the NDAA, which would make the president able to arrest any of us at any time for any reason and hold us forever. Um, and that's how Occupy got crushed, not because it isn't a movement that uh, had plenty of room to flourish. So the obvious conditions for truth-telling is um, dem democracy and human rights. In other words, the right to speak, which is what Penn is about, the right to uh, due process so that you can't be arbitrarily arrested because you're saying something unpopular, um, the right for citizens to have transparency and accountability from their police forces. There's a very important bill up here in New York to create some oversight of the NYPD, and Ray Kelly is very much opposed to it. 
but I did some reporting, and it turns out that the big banks have hired the police of New York and have done this across the country so that they are going to beat up protesters who are protesting the big banks. You notice they're not being violent to people who are protesting for, you know, the environment, for, you know, I don't know what, you know, other things. They're, they're just brutalizing people who are protesting big banks. The banks have hired NYPD. Um, you'll notice in some banks when you go in, there's an armed NYPD officer in the bank, on the bank's payroll. I wrote about that in The Guardian. Um, so, yeah, democracy, transparency, human rights, due process, freedom of speech, those are conditions that allow truth tellers to not be intimidated and silenced. And then the truth, as you say, has its own um, metastasizing power. Thank you so much, Naomi and Ben, and thank, thank you, you to all of you for coming and to Penn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.